On behalf of Prison Fellowship and the Chuck Colson Center for Christian Worldview, we are pleased to present the 2015 William Wilberforce Award to Rob, Professor Robert P. George. Yeah. Congratulations. I want to thank all of you for uh, coming to share this evening with me and with, uh, with my family. So many uh, great and dear friends are out here and so many heroes of the causes uh, in which I have myself uh, labored are here. And I, and I just want you to know how deeply uh, I appreciate your, your, your coming out and your listening to all those uh, wonderful, uh, excessively gracious things that were uh, said about me. Uh, I want to say a special word of thanks. Uh, to Emily and Chris and Cheryl and to the Colson family. And please convey my deepest gratitude to dear uh, Patty. Uh, you know what your father uh, meant to me. Uh, Patty knows what Chuck uh, meant to me. And it's just very special uh, to have you here this evening and to receive the wonderful Wedgwood token uh, from Chuck, in a sense, through Patty, from Chuck through Patty. Uh, I will treasure it as I treasure my memories of of your father and the wonderful relationship that I had with him. He was a great mentor and example uh, to me, as he was to millions, literally millions uh, of others. I want to say a special word of thanks on this particular occasion to my own dear parents who are here, Joseph and uh, Catherine George. Uh, they uh, nurtured me in the Christian faith uh, as a child. They made possible the education that I received and Everything uh, in my life is ultimately uh, traceable to their kindness and generosity and, and uh, love. And I, I uh, am really, above all this evening, happy just for the opportunity publicly to, uh, uh, to say that. Uh, my, my mother uh, nurtured her five sons uh, uh, in the Christian faith. Uh, it involved not only uh, prayer and uh, the sacraments, but uh, and we, we were okay with prayer and the sacraments. It's when she would make us go down and clean the church hall and cut the lawn down at the church and so forth that we got a little less enthusiastic uh, about it. But she wanted to inculcate in us a sense of our obligation uh, to, our, uh, to our community and, and that certainly worked. Uh, my father was, is, and always will be uh, my hero. Uh, he is a war hero, a chevalier of the Legion of Honor of France, a uh, uh, member of the Order of uh, Lafayette who uh, fought at Brittany and at uh, Normandy, who uh, uh, was among those who was sent into the sea when the Germans sunk the Leopoldville in the English Channel on its way uh, over to France. A thousand men uh, lost, 800 survived. Fortunately for me, my father was one of the survivors and because he not only survived but was in good shape uh, when the British uh, picked him up, instead of sending him back to England, he was sent uh, down to Europe uh, to fight where he fought uh, heroically uh, and you know far beyond uh, even beyond that uh, story that that we heard so much about I just watched growing up a, a great man a great father a great husband and having a great mother who I saw also in her role as a uh, as a great wife was just everything it was just such an inspiration and and I want to do my best uh, to make that available that kind of thing available to as many children as possible. I mean, what could be a greater gift uh, to children than a mom and a dad uh, together committed uh, to each other in love and to their uh, children? And much of what I fight for on the marriage front is really motivated by my own experience of that great blessing and, uh, and gift. I also want to say a special word of thanks to my cousin John and his uh, wife, Teresa, uh, who brought my uh, parents over to Washington, D.C. And it's um, uh, wonderful to uh, uh, have them here together with uh, their daughter, Audra, and their son-in-law, uh, Jeremy. So thanks so much uh, for coming. John is the son of my father's eldest brother, whose name was, this is for real, George George, George M. George. <laughs> there's, a, there's a complicated Syrian story behind that. We're Syrian on my father's side, Syrian Orthodox Christians, and there's a, there's a complicated story. <laughs> Uh, behind that, but I, I, I bring it up because one of the most wonderful religious experiences I ever had in my life uh, was one that I had indirectly. It was it was observing, or more accurately, hearing 
someone else's religious experience or religious activity. Um, I uh, often stayed when I was a teenager at my grandmother's house across the street. She was widowed by then and living alone, so uh, I would, uh, I would uh, often stay over there with her. And uh, my uh, Uncle George was visiting uh, with his wife, my Aunt Nooney, we called her. And uh, they were uh, staying in one of the bedrooms, and I was in one of the other uh, bedrooms. And I don't know if uh, any of you know Syrian Christians, but they, they have a custom, I think this is probably true of other Eastern Christians, of, of saying the normal prayers that, that we would say at bedtime to ourselves, but they, they say them out loud. And I, uh, I heard my uncle praying aloud at his bedside as he prepared uh, to, to retire uh, for the day. And what was so profoundly moving to me about that is my uncle was talking to God as if God was standing there next to him. His relationship was so personal. You talk about a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior that we all aspire to. It was so personal that anybody who just happened by and heard this can only be called conversation going on would think that there were two people uh, in the room. Now, of course, the literal truth is there were. <laughs> he was talking to God very uh, personally. But that beautiful, gentle, simple faith and that lovely, deep relationship with God was very uh, moving to me. So that makes it special, John, for, for you and Teresa and Audra and Jeremy to be uh, with us this evening. Um, as uh, my dear friend and principal co-conspirator co Luis uh, Teles uh, mentioned to you, I have uh, had the great good fortune of receiving a few awards uh, in my life. But let me tell you, uh, especially let me tell the people at the Colson Center and the Colson family that uh, none of the awards that I've been blessed to receive uh, uh, is more important or meaningful to me than this award. And that's really for two reasons. One is my great admiration for William Wilberforce. I'll, I'll say a bit more about that later, but my great admiration for a man who dedicated his life, Sharif, to the cause. It was not about William Wilberforce. It was about defending the dignity of the oppressed, recognizing in the African slave an individual, a human being, a person made in the very image and likeness of the divine creator and ruler of the universe. Wilberforce fought against what seemed impossible, seemed like impossible odds. He endured ridicule, defamation, abuse, in order to stand for the dignity of the slave. It was about that for Wilberforce. It was not about him. It wasn't about being a hero. It wasn't about the recognition that he would eventually and rightly get, but that was not what motivated him. It was this respect for the basic dignity of the human being that caused him to stand up and speak out, no matter the cost, for the oppressed. He's a great hero of mine. And uh, to have an award named for him uh, is far more than I deserve, uh, but one that I very, very uh, much welcome and am grateful for. Secondly, of course, the fact that the award was created by Chuck. Uh, as I say, Chuck was a mentor, he was an inspiration, and a very, very, very dear friend. Uh, and to receive the Wilberforce Award, an award that has been received by so many others that I admire, um, Cardinal Dolan, Johnny Erickson Tata, um, the vicar of Baghdad, the great hero, the great courageous uh, Anglican um, vicar, Andrew White, uh, well, my gosh, that's, that's overwhelming, uh, and I'm just so very, very grateful. My goodness, Congressman Frank Wolf, to, uh, to be the subject of praise uh, from you is simply overwhelming because Frank Wolf is the modern Wil uh, William Wilberforce. There is no one who has done more. No one who has done more in the cause of defending the persecuted and oppressed than Congressman uh, Wolf has done. And he has earned the respect of people across the spectrum 
Democrats as well as Republicans, liberals as well as conservatives. There, there is no uh, member of the United States Congress, with perhaps the exception of Bernie Sanders, more liberal than Congressman McGovern from Massachusetts. And yet, I heard with my own ears Congressman McGovern say publicly that if he were a citizen, uh, uh, a resident of Frank Wolf's district, he would vote for Frank Wolf no matter which Democrat was running <laughs> against him. You don't hear that kind of talk in Washington very often, and that tells you just what kind of a man Frank Wolf is and the esteem in which he is held for his obvious, selfless devotion to the cause of human rights. So blessed to have that tribute uh, uh, by video uh, from uh, Timothy George. I, if I had more time, and I know we've held you too long already, so I'm going to not take the time, but if I had more time, I could tell you some of the stories that, uh, uh, stories of, of drafting the, uh, the uh, Manhattan Declaration uh, together. Uh, when, when Chuck Colson gives you a job, you've got a job. Uh, when he puts you to work, you are uh, put to work. Uh, and you work hard. Uh, and you work long hours. And you got to get it just right. Uh, and Timothy and I, uh, under uh, Chuck's uh, uh, leadership, devoted ourselves uh, to doing the work together. I'll just tell you one little story about that. I did the original draft. I sent it to Timothy. He improved it in lots of ways. It went back and forth between the two of us. Then we sent it to Chuck, who was, who was happy with it. He had very few uh, uh, comments, but his, his comment was, now we have to move forward and we have to convene a meeting of 80 religious leaders, Catholic cardinals and archbishops and the Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Metropolitan and the, the uh, leaders in, of the evangelical community, Pastor Tim Keller and, and James Dobson and Al Mohler and uh, some of the great uh, figures in uh, evangelicaldom uh, and see what they think and, uh, and then we'll get this thing uh, out there. So uh, I thought it was in pretty good shape. So. I, I thought basically the point of the meeting would be to present to these religious leaders our work and ask them if they would agree to sign on to it and then we would make it public. So we spent the better part of a, of a morning uh, presenting uh, the work and uh, then it came time to conclude and uh, I thought that Chuck would say, uh, well, now we need to know, uh, if you'd, you know if you'd like to sign on to this. And instead, Chuck said, all right, now you've, you, you've heard the presentation. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to send you the draft that uh, the two professors, George, have just, uh, have just presented. And we want your comments on ways to, 80 religious leaders, we want your comments on ways to improve. improve and my heart sank. <laughs> I said, oh my gosh, we're going to get 80. You know, these are 80 people who have, believe it or not, Opinions, Religion, and, you know, and believe it or not, their opinions are not all the same. And in fact, their opinions were in many cases mutually contradictory. They were exclu mutually exclusive. So I knew we were going to be in big trouble and a lot more uh, work to do as soon as Chuck said that. But you know, Chuck has spoken. The cause is finished. Uh, we sent it out, and we got back nearly 80 sets of comments with suggestions for improving the document. But I figured out that it boiled down basically to this. The evangelicals thought there wasn't enough scripture and wanted more scripture in it. The Catholics thought there wasn't enough reason and wanted more natural law in it. The Orthodox just wanted more of the Trinity in it. <laughs> so I figured, we can do this. We just throw everything in, more natural law, more scripture, more trinity. <laughs> and that's what we did. And uh, we, we finally got something that we thought would satisfy all of the, uh, all of the religious leaders. But it turned out then that, that we were still not in perfect harmony because Chuck and Timothy decided that this work, which by now I thought was perfect, they decided we needed a preamble. And I said, Chuck, we don't need a preamble. It's perfect the way we don't need a preamble. Oh, no, no. We need a preamble. Timothy thinks we need a preamble, too. Timothy, do you think we need a Oh, yes, I agree with Chuck. We need a preamble. 
So I'm figuring it's two to one. So I thought, okay, well look, I don't think it needs a preamble. I, I think it's perfect just the way it is. But let's do this. Why don't, why don't you just ask a few friends who you really trust about whether you need a preamble? And I'll ask a few friends I really trust. Well, they asked the evangelicals and I asked the Catholics. All the Catholics said, no, it's perfect just the way it is. All the evangelicals said, we need a preamble. <laughs> so I finally figured out, Russell, what the Reformation was actually about. <laughs> Not justification, it was about preambles. <laughs> But being magnanimous, the Catholics yielded, and, uh, and, we got a, and we got a preamble. All I can say is, uh, <laughs> well, now you can yield on the others, right? We've done our part. You can. So, um, all, but, but I want to insist that I'm not the guy. If you, if, if, if you like the preamble, God bless you. If you don't like the preamble, I'm not the guy who wrote it. Timothy's the guy who wrote that. <laughs> Katrina, Katrina, thank you. Katrina herself is a great hero of the human rights movement. Of course, her father was a great hero of international human rights. And it's just been such a joy to work at the US Commission on International Religious Freedom under Katrina's uh, leadership and by her uh, side. And, and, and while, I'm, while I'm recognizing and thanking Katrina, I want to thank my other allies uh, and dear friends and sisters uh, at the commission. Uh, Ambassador Jackie Wolcott, who's our Executive Director, and Judy Golub, who is our Congressional Person and Communications Director. God bless them. I mean to tell you, they work every day, and it's 24-7, in the cause of religious freedom. And it's not easy. You would think religious freedom, right? Everybody's for it. At least everybody in the United States is for it. It turns out that everybody in the United States is for it formally. But when we get down to specifics, we get down to cases, we get down to the need to speak up, then we need, get down to the need to spend a little capital, the need, we get down to the need to take some risks, we, need, we come down to the need to put some other values, things that we care about at, at, at stake in order to advance the cause of religious liberty, relieve and mitigate the suffering of the, of the persecuted, uh, come to the aid of prisoners of conscience. Well, not everybody's so eager to, eager to join. Uh, and there are some people who even throw some obstacles in the way. But, but the staff and my colleagues at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, led by Katrina and Jackie, are always there. They are always there working, having dedicated their lives to this, this great cause. And I just want to say God bless uh, all of you and thank you. Circa Blue, the band Circa Blue, weren't they terrific? They were just great. <laughs> It's just such a pleasure to, uh, to be with them. Uh, Cardinal Donald Worrell, Ca Cardinal uh, Worrell uh, said something that, that I hope really pleased my mother. Um, I think it's the first time anybody has ever accused me of being quiet. He referred to my persistent but quiet uh, voice. Uh, my mother always thought I might be a little too noisy. Uh, she used to have a... Um, have a saying, she would warn uh, the five of us, we were five boys, pretty rambunctious uh, bunch, and uh, we, we could be pretty noisy and pretty self-assertive and, and in, in people's faces too much and so forth. And so she had a saying, I don't know if she got it from her Italian mother where he, she got it, but she would warn us when we were going out to, 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 to do something or to participate in some event where there would be speaking or conversation that we should keep two feet in one shoe to try to be, you know, more humble. I wasn't very good at this and less noisy, but, uh, but see, Cardinal Whirl says that I'm quiet, mother. So yeah, Cardinal, the prince of the church says that I'm, I'm quiet. Russell, what a great brother, fellow soldier, country music uh, fan. Uh, I, my heart leapt for joy when it was announced that Russell Moore would be president, at, at the age of 11, would be president of the uh, <laughs> Ethics and Religious uh, Liberty uh, uh, E.R. Ethics Commission, Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the uh, of the Southern uh, Baptist Convention. I also want to claim the credit for Russell because I think it's probably I, I, I'm guessing I'm, I'm guessing I'm going out on a limb here. I think it was when when I was consulted by the uh, by the board uh, of the Southern Baptists about 
who I thought might make a good uh, leader. I think I was probably the first Catholic ever to be consulted by, by the board. I said, that it, it's an easy choice, it's Russell Moore. Now, I, 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 when, I, when I said that, I, the words were scarcely out of my mouth before I realized, did I just sink Russell? Will he now be perceived as the Catholic candidate? For, <laughs> but um, uh, no, they, uh, they did exactly the right thing uh, and appointed Russell, and what a, what a tremendous leader and successor to Richard Land Russell has uh, proven to be. It, I, I could, I could mention a thousand wonderful things that Russell has done uh, for the cause. I'm just going to mention one, which is that recently he uh, held uh, uh, down in Nashville uh, a major meeting uh, on uh, racial reconciliation in the, in the Christian church. And it was just a magnificent, uh, a magnificent event, bringing together black and white Christians who for crazy reasons have been separated uh, historically for, uh, for so long, uh, not talking to each other. They say that Sunday morning is the most segregated time in the, uh, uh, time of the time of the week. And, and there is Russell out there on top of all the other things that he's doing, um, uh, raising the flag and advancing the cause of racial reconciliation. And I'll tell you, we, we need, in the Christian church and the religious community more broadly, um, we need to... Uh, to put aside the, the old unnecessary divisions. We, you know, there are theological things, they're important. Uh, someone mentioned this earlier. You know, we, we have to take those differences seriously. But there's also a lot of unnecessary stuff that has divided Christian racial things. Race doesn't mean it. Why should there be racial division about anything, right? So uh, those kinds of things, we need to overcome what stands in our way because, my dear friends, faith is under severe assault. Abroad, yes, but also at home in many, many ways, and the religious community has to be united as people of faith in standing up for the right to religious freedom, the right to uh, freedom of uh, conscience. Uh, Helen Alvare, thank you, Helen. Thank you for your wonderful, kind words and for the witness you have uh, given in the church, your work in the church, and also uh, in, the, uh, in the academic uh, world. Uh, I love it when some uh, person advancing some cause I don't believe in, uh, some female person advancing some cause I don't believe in, will claim to be speaking on behalf of women. Well, full stop. Women. As if all women are supposed to believe what she believes. The reason I love that is because I know Helen is going to take her down in 15 minutes. You know, if it's on the internet, Helen will see it, and there'll be history, right? I mean, it'll be like one of those uh, Women's World Wrestling Federation uh, <laughs> events, and I always know who the winner's going to be. It's going to be uh, Helen. Uh, Luis is my, Luis Tellez is my principal uh, co-conspirator. Nothing that I have done uh, in, in the academy or beyond really would have been possible without uh, Luis's uh, uh, fellowship without his hard work, without his fundraising, uh, without, without his advice and, uh, and uh, counsel. Uh, I, I, I was okay with uh, Luis's line uh, about uh, my liberal colleagues um, both respecting and fearing me. I kind of liked, uh, I, I kind of liked that, but then, L then Sharif went and let the cat out of the bag uh, to tell the rest of the story about why maybe there is a little fear by revealing that my motto is um, forgive but retaliate. Uh, all I can say is, you know, if you're going to survive in the academic world today and you have views like mine and many of, of, of yours, uh, that's a darn good motto to live by. <laughs> forgive but retaliate. My other motto is never play defense. Always play offense. As soon as you're on defense, the game's over. You've got to make sure they're worried more about you than you're worried about uh, them. I say this to my, uh, to my graduate students, and so far they've done a great job of um, um, following me on that. Uh, speaking of my graduate students, I, I'm just honored, deeply honored, that Rabbi Soloveitchik, who was my student in uh, philosophy of law at Princeton, uh, is here this evening and gave those wonderful words of uh, tribute. Uh, Rabbi uh, Soloveitchik, as some of you know, uh, uh, is the... Um, a member of an extremely eminent uh, Orthodox Jewish uh, family. Uh, his grandfather and his uh, grand uncle were great figures. Uh, his grand uncle, uh, Joseph Soloveitchik, is the founder of modern Orthodox Judaism, uh, one of the greatest scholars in the history of, 
of, uh, of Judaism. His works, by the way, are, are read with great profit by Christians uh, as well as by uh, Jews. Uh, his works such as Halakhic Man and his work on the family, uh, as a matter of fact. And, and Sully, as I call him, uh, Sully uh, is a very worthy uh, representative of that family carrying on the great uh, tradition uh, of his forebears. Can I tell you a little story about uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik? I was so thrilled. I'm a little bit of a partisan Republican. I, I began as a Democrat, but you know, like so many of the uh, Democrats of my boyhood, ended up gravitating to the other side, mostly because of the the, the issues that we're you were here to talk about this evening. Um, but I was thrilled when Rabbi Soloveitchik was chosen to give the opening prayer at the Republican National uh, Convention last time. Now, if you'll recall, Cardinal Dolan was invited to give the closing prayer and accepted that invitation. Now, of course, uh, because uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik is still a very young man, not quite as well known as Cardinal Dolan, Cardinal Dolan's acceptance of the invitation got all the, all the publicity. And it got so much publicity that an enterprising reporter stuck a microphone uh, under Cardinal Dolan's nose and said, Cardinal Dolan, you've been invited to uh, give the closing prayer at the Republican National Convention. You've agreed. If you were invited by the Democrats to give the closing prayer at their convention, would you agree to do that? And Cardinal Dolan said, well, yes, of course I would agree to do that. And that threw the Democrats into a panic, Katrina, you'll, you'll remember, and, and, and they, at first someone said, well, we, but we're not interested in inviting Cardinal Dolan, and that didn't work. So they you know, within 48 hours they changed, they had invited Cardinal Dolan, and Cardinal Dolan accepted, and he gave the closing prayer at both conventions. But um, another, even more enterprising and creative reporter uh, seized on that and stuck a microphone under Rabbi Soloveitchik's nose and said, well, how about you? Uh, Cardinal Dolan has agreed to give the closing prayer at the Democrat as well as the Republican Convention. You are going to be giving the closing prayer, the opening prayer at the Republican Convention. If you're asked to give the opening prayer at the Democratic Convention, would you agree to give it? And uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I immediately, uh, I, I, among my treasures is Cardinal Dolan's uh, cell phone number. So I immediately called Cardinal Dolan on the telephone uh, and uh, reported this. He hadn't himself seen it yet in the story, so I, I reported what Rabbi Soloveitchik and said, uh, had said, and I uh, said to Cardinal Dolan, well, I guess you can easily see which one of you was my student. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be okay. We're going to be okay, as dark as it may seem, on the issues that we so deeply care about religious freedom at home and abroad, the sanctity of human life, the dignity of marriage. We're okay uh, when we have people in the rising generation like Andrew Walker and Sharif Gerges. I mean, they are absolutely fantastic. They are such brilliant representatives of a larger group of evangelical, Catholic, Mormon, Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, uh, Orthodox Jewish young people. I could name you more of my own students, Danielle, Mark, Melissa, uh, Moskella, of course, Gabby, uh, Gergis Sharif's wife, who's also my student. He didn't mention that, but he mentioned that, that we're full service mentors, but we provide everything, you know, spouses. You, 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 you know. But Sharif and Andrew are representatives of the best, the cream of the crop of this generation of young uh, intellectuals who have not only brilliance, I see a lot of brilliance, I get to teach at Princeton and at Harvard, so, you know, I see a lot of brilliance, okay? That's why I see a lot of brilliance. What you don't see a lot of is courage. And these young men exemplify, as do the others I've mentioned, and so many more, courage as well as brilliance. And with that courage and that brilliance, with that combination, we're going to be okay. It's looking pretty dark. Things are bad. This is a rough time. It's a rough period. But we're going to be okay. Sharif told the story of writing to me uh, as a kind of funny story on himself. Uh, and he only told part of the, uh, the story. He was a high school student. I got this email from a high school student in Dover, Delaware. Uh, and it wasn't just that he wrote to me and said that he'd read my work and he thought it was awesome and, and, and so forth. He also said, um, uh, you know, here's what I've been thinking about. Here's what I, uh, uh, my ideas are. Uh, here's what I learned from some of your uh, writing. Uh, I'd really like to uh, come to Princeton and and study with you, and I don't know if that's, if that's realistic. My parents sort of want me to, to go here to the, 
State University uh, in, in Delaware, but I really would love to, to come to Princeton. Well, I was impressed with the letter, but I, I, had to, I had to do what you have to do. I get a lot of those kinds of letters, uh, which is ask the hard questions because you don't want to get students' hopes up um, where they'll only be dashed. And the hard questions are basically, what are your SAT scores and what are your high school grades? And so I wrote back and Sharif told me what his SAT scores were and what his high school grades were. And I basically said, yes, you can come to Princeton. <laughs> <to, laughs> there wasn't any doubt in my mind about uh, whether he was going to be uh, admitted. And he was admitted uh, and uh, he, uh, he rocked the place. Um, he, he mentioned his undergraduate thesis, which was a defense of traditional sexual ethics at Princeton in the Ivy League in the Department of Philosophy. So you want to know what you're up against there. Um, he, he, he wrote that uh, thesis under the uh, 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 supervision. Uh, I, I wasn't formally supervised. We, I was kind of informally helping, but his formal supervisor was a person who was 180 degrees. Uh, on the other side, who I think wrote, Shreve, correct me if I'm wrong, something like a hundred comments, hundred critical comments on the paper before giving it an A. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, it did go on. Sharif mentioned that it won uh, the prize for the best thesis overall in philosophy. It also won the prize for the best thesis uh, in ethics. Now, get this, at Princeton, tradition, defense of traditional norms of chastity in the philosophy department winning both prizes, the prizes for the best thesis in ethics and the prize for the best thesis uh, in overall uh, philosophy. But that's not all. He won the National Dante Prize for the best prize written, uh, the best essay on Dante written by a student anywhere in the United States. He graduated summa cum laude. He was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, he, um, he went on to win a Rhodes Scholarship uh, over to Oxford, uh, did his master's degree there and then was admitted to Yale Law School, as well as to the PhD program in philosophy at Princeton, which I think admits one student in ethics uh, a year, uh, and decided to accept both offers, so he's completing his JD at Yale Law School and uh, his, uh, his uh, PhD in philosophy at, uh, at, at Princeton. Um, I taught the boy everything he knows. <laughs> <laughs> Wish I could claim that. Uh, but again, I say, as I say of, uh, uh, of Andrew, when, when we've got that kind of power working for the cause or the causes, uh, we're going to be okay. Uh, I just want to conclude uh, with an exhortation. Um, I, I, I know that many of you believe, as, as I believe, and the core of our belief, right at the foundation of everything, is a single principle. We can articulate it in theological terms that will be familiar to Christians and Jews, or we can articulate it in natural law terms. When we articulate it in theological terms, we articulate it as the principle that man, every human individual, no matter how weak, frail, handicapped, disabled, poor, afflicted, every drug addicted, whatever, Every human being is made in the very image and likeness of God. That's the theological articulation. The natural law articulation of the principle is that we believe in the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of every member of the human family. That's at the core of everything. If we affirm that, and if we're faithful to it, and if we're prepared to follow its logic, it will open up into everything else we believe. Why do we believe in marriage and the family? Because we know that they are essential to the well-being of children. And children, like everybody else, bear a profound, inherent, and equal dignity. You're made in the very image and likeness of God. Why do we believe in religious liberty and the rights of conscience? Why do we believe that? I can tell a very elaborate story about it, but it will all boil down to because we believe that every individual has a profound, inherent, and equal dignity. That applies to Christians, it applies to Jews, but it applies to persecuted Ahmadiyya Muslims or Rohingya Muslims or any Muslims. It applies to Buddhists, it applies to Hindus, it applies to Sikhs, it applies to atheists. 
we affirm it not only as a rational principle, but also as a theological principle, those of us who are believers. Why do we believe in religious liberty? Because every human being is made in the image and likeness of God. That means every human being is free and rational. That's what's God-like about us. It's not that God has five fingers on each of two hands and hair on his head and a nose. What's God-like about us is not those physical features, though those physical features are part of who we are, they're part of the personal reality of ourselves as human beings, but what's God-like is that we are free and rational. And because we're free and rational, we have consciences. And because we have consciences, we apprehend duties. And because we have duties and must fulfill them in order to be authentic people, people with integrity, because of that, we must be free to fulfill them, to worship God as we believe God wishes himself to be worshiped. And we will disagree with human beings because we're free. We will disagree about the particulars. We may disagree even about whether there is a God. The conscientious atheist may be wrestling in his own mind, may want to know the truth, but as best he can see it, it's an atheistic truth. The picture does not involve God. But that person, too, must live with integrity and authenticity in light of his best conscientious judgments. And so we recognize that to force him to act as if he believed something else, as if he believed in God, as if he believed in the Christian faith, to force him to attend religious services would be a violation of the rights of conscience, a violation of his religious freedom. And the same applies to everyone else with every shade of belief. And, the, and then even if we move to issues that are important but less foundational and fundamental, still very, very important, like economic issues, the desire for prosperity, or environmental integrity, having a, having a healthy and, and, and aesthetically pleasing environment. Why do we care about those things? Because we believe that human beings have fundamental inherent dignity and worth, each human being. The economy is for man. The environment is for man. And we take care on those issues and use our very best judgment, though much of our judgment in those domains must be prudential. Moral norms won't tell us how to keep the environment clean. They will tell us to keep the environment clean for the benefit of people. They will tell us to try to make for a prosperous economy for the well-being of people. But we will disagree about how. There are legitimate disagreements at the level of prudence about how much government intervention in the economy there should be, how free the market should be. Those are legitimate debates that can be had between and among people who share the fundamental conviction that every human being has a profound inherent and equal dignity. And the same could be true about debates about the environment but we wouldn't even care about the environment and getting it right or about the economy and getting it right unless we had the fundamental belief in the dignity of the human being. So that's why we fight. That's why my colleagues and I at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom fight. That's why Bill Saunders and Charmaine and other leaders of the, of the pro-life movement fight. That's why Luis and Matt and all the people who've been so vitally involved in the marriage movement fight. It's because we know at the end of these day, at the day, at the end of the day, what's at stake is the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of the human being. That's what I've tried to dedicate myself to. I wish I had done better. I will try to do better. But I'm deeply grateful to you for recognizing the efforts that I have made, and I want to dedicate the Wilberforce Award that I had the blessing to receive tonight to all my fellow laborers in all of these great causes, to all who work because they share my belief in the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of every member of the human family. Thank you again, and God bless you.